God, your Father, wrapping his arms around you in love as well. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we just come this morning, Father, to hear, God, the truth, God, of your word, Father. What it is that you're saying to each one of us individually, Lord, and to us corporately, Father. God, I pray now, Father, that I decrease, Lord God, that you may increase, Father, those things, God, that you have given me in my time of study, Lord God. May I only speak of those things, God, and not of myself, Father. It is in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Amen. You can have your seats. Thank you, Monty. Thank you. We're going to release our sprouts to the children's ministry now. Amen. Amen. Oh, welcome this morning. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Just give me a moment to get myself <laughs> back together. I, I love when Mandy does the little mashup, just because I know Bryce is trying to keep up with the words, but as the spirit leads her, she just she puts whatever God puts on her heart. That's that's what she sings. So. All right, good morning, good morning, good morning. I want to welcome you into worship this morning as we continue in our unplanned sermon series. I didn't have a series planned, but it has somehow taken on that of a series about Jesus and his resurrecting hope. We've been learning that the resurrection of Jesus Christ gives us the power to face any difficulty we may ever face. Not that we've just, that we faced in the past, we may be facing now, but that we will ever face because of his resurrection hope. He overcame death and the grave, and nothing is possible that can come up against him that he can't handle. We might not be able to handle it, but Jesus surely can handle it. You know, his resurrection was a shot to Mary Magdalene. She went there to the grave on Easter, and he wasn't there. She was shocked. But you know what? She was filled with hope that he was alive. He had said he was going to tear down the temple and rebuild it. So she was filled with hope. Peter was restored after his denial of Jesus Christ by the love of the resurrection of Jesus. Jesus' grace overcame all of Peter's failings. Two weeks ago, Elder Barbara who yesterday it was her birthday, so let's wish her a happy birthday, (laughs) Elder Barbara. Two weeks ago, Elder Barbara let us know that we could be filled with hope in the fact that everything Jesus did in his earthly ministry was a sacrifice. He didn't have to do it. He wasn't required to do it, but he wanted to. He wanted to come off his place of comfort for you and I. You know, we discovered that Jesus, just as we feel pain, he felt pain as well. But because of what he did on the cross, we all have the ability to overcome that pain and continue to live on. Last week was Resurrection Sunday, and Pastor Pearl gave a a powerful message about letting us know that the rolling away of the stone was a witness of the power of God, was a witness of the power of the resurrection of hope. It gave us an assurance and a hope in the resurrection, in his arising. She not only let us know, but she encouraged us to stand up. She said it many times. She said, stand up. When things are rough, stand up. She even said the words to arise and shine. So as we continue on today, let's talk about the end of someone's life. What happens at the end of someone's life? If they're on their deathbed, maybe they're in the hospital, maybe they're at home on hospice. Then they would say, hey, you know what, Rebecca? Man, I really wish we had went to Cozumel. I really wish we had went on more vacations. I really wish that, you know, I would have finish that project that I had outside. No, no, that's not what happens 
when people are at the end of their story. They talk about healing the broken relationships that they may have. They talk about spending more time with family. The conversations are around the things that matter to them the most. When time is limited, people speak from the heart. And in these final words, we need to really pay attention that the things that are most important to the individual. You know that, I forgot what they call, is it make a wish or make a dream where the, pe- the children are, 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 are terminally sick and they have a wish and typically it's to meet somebody or, or to do something. Those are the things that th- are important to them. Well, as Jesus is entering Jerusalem for the last time, he is accompanied by his boys, by his posse, by his day ones. Who, who is that? That's the disciples. That's who he was coming with. And Jews from all over the world have flooded to the area to celebrate the festival of the Passover. They would commemorate this time in history when God had removed them from bondage and the slavery in Egypt for the celebration of the Passover. Jesus and his disciples find themselves going to get some grub. They went to Outback to order the steak, baked potatoes, some vegetables, some of that blooming onion thing. They, they was hungry. And after they ate, Jesus washed the disciples' feet. He provided an example. And then the gospel records Je- Jesus' final prayer. These are some of the last words that Jesus went to before his death. The title of today's message is The Unit of One. And before we get into the message, I want to just give you a quick video clip of kind of what this message is all about. So just turn your attention to the screen. So the big idea of this message, the unit of one, which is about unity, the unit of one. When you think about a football team, it's a unit with many parts that make up the unit, but they come together to work as one. They don't play the same position, but they're all striving to reach the same goal line. Same thing in basketball. You're trying to go to the same goal. When somebody gets the rebound and they go to the wrong goal, we always say, what's, what's wrong with him? So a unit of one. So today's scripture is coming from John 17, chapter 17. Um, the key verses are 20 through 21. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start at the beginning of the chapter. Jesus, this is often known as the high priestly prayer. So in verses 1 through 5, Jesus prays for himself. And I'm going to read verses 1 and 2. I'm going to read a lot of scripture today because that, that's the basis of everything. That's the foundation. It's not about Pastor Ed's opinion. It's not about my experience. It's about the word of God. After saying all these things, Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son so he can give glory back to you. For you have given him authority over everyone. He gives eternal life to you that you have given. Jesus prays for himself. Sometimes I've heard people say, you don't need to pray for yourself, you need to pray for others. Jesus is praying for himself right now. He knows what's coming, but he prays for himself. 
He prays over the blessing of his ministry up to that point, and he asks that God glorify him. But why? Only so he can give the glory back unto God. Jesus then prays for his disciples, verses 6 through 19. I'm going to read a few verses here. I'm going to read verse 9 first. Verse 9 says, my prayer is not for the world, but for those you have given me because they belong to you. He's praying for his disciples. He's praying for his boys. He's praying for the ones that he has intentionally take t- has taken time to pour into. Verse number 11 says, Now that I am departing the world, they are staying in this world, but I am coming to you. Holy Father, you have given me your name. Now protect them by power, by the power of your name, so they will be united just as we are. You know, we live in this human body. And we got feelings, and we got emotions, and we got things. And sometimes we can rub each other the wrong way. And Jesus knew that. So what does he do? He he prays for them that they will be united just as you and I are one. That's what he says to the Father. Verse 15. I'm not asking you to take them out of the world, but to keep them safe from the evil one. Now, we live in this world, and there's a lot of stuff going on. All we got to do is go back to this prayer. We are not of this world. We're here, but we're not of this world. Jesus, keep us safe from the evil one. And then verse 17, make them holy by your truth. What is the truth? The truth is God's word. And it says, teach them your word, which is truth. If we ever need to know and understand and we're not sure, all we need to do is go in this book here and ask God for the truth of his word. And there are some things that we don't necessarily understand, and I'll even talk about that later. There are things in the scripture, I don't care how many times that you read it, in these earthly bodies that we have, these mortal bodies, we will never completely understand the fullness of it on this side of glory. We just got to trust in his word that it is true. Amen? And then finally, Jesus prays for believers and followers, and this is verse 20 through 26, and I will read all of these here. Verse 20, I am praying not only for these disciples, but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. I pray that they will all They will all be one, just as you and I are one. As you are in me, Father, and I am in you. And may they be in us so that the world will believe you sent me. I have given them the glory you gave me so they may be one as we are one. I am in them and you are in me. May they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. Father, I want these whom you have given me to be with me where I am. Then they can see all the glory you gave me because you love me even before the world began. O righteous Father, the world does not know you, but I do. And these disciples know you sent me. I have revealed you to them and will continue to do so. Then your love for me will be in them, and I will be in them. Man, that is awesome. He turned the prayer from himself. He turned his prayer from the disciples, and it says that he prayed for all, all, all. See, we didn't, we didn't personally hear the disciples' words. But the words of the disciple as they spent time with Jesus and as the Gospels were written, it has been passed down from time to time. And now we are benefit, benefactors, beneficiaries of that word that has gone forth. And Jesus himself prayed for each and every one of us. Even the ones who have yet to be born, they were prayed for by Jesus. That we would know and that we would be one and that we would come together. 
Jesus prays that they and we will be unified as one, as he and the Father of one. You see, the love of God unites us all. The love of God unites us, unites us all. See, Christians are described in Scripture as a body. The eye can't say to the hand, I have no need of you. You know, it's described as a body. And when the body works against itself, it never really turns out good. You know, one of the things that when, when I was pledging my fraternity, you have a number of people that are joining the fraternity at the same time of you, at the same time as you, and it could be any number. For me, there was nine of us, and I was the number three. We were some big guys. We all played football. And people would, the, the, the big brothers would ask us, how many of you are online? Well, the first thing we would all say, hey, it's nine of us. And my son, it was 20 on his line, and he would say it was 20. How many for you, Tracy? 16. We'll say there's 16 of us. No, 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 no. We're one with 16 movable parts. We're one with nine movable parts. As the body of Christ, we're one with umpteen movable parts. The love of God unites us all. You see, the world we live in is incredibly div divided. We know that. We're fractured along political lines, theological lines, and everything in between. And people oftentimes look more for the reason why we're not alike and a, a reason to entrench themselves in an argument that ensures division. The Bible says it is because of God's great love for the world that he sent his only son. Only because he loved us. That's why he sent his son. Take note of this. I want you to take note of this here. God loves every human being on the planet. Take note of that. Whether we love them or whether we care for them or not, God loves every human being on this planet. Point number two from there. There is no one, no one, N-O, who is beyond the love of the Father. <laughs> Y'all, if he can save Pastor Ed, y'all y'all just y'all just don't know. I back in my day, I had a grimy side to me. A side that I don't really want anybody to know about. But God thought so much of me that because of the word of the disciples all those years ago, and that word that went forward, and somebody thought enough of me, Ed Canty, to speak that word to me that I was able to say. Oh, God, I need you. You love me. I don't really understand it. I don't know why, but thank you so much for loving me. There is no one that is beyond the love of God. Jesus came to unite us under God's love that we might be one with each other because he is one God. Unity in the body of Christ is vital. In fact, it is commanded. How can we be in unity? That's what we're going to talk about today. Before I ask that, let me ask a question that I don't really want you to answer. I want you to think about it. And since everybody is saved and holy and sanctified, you got to think back at another, another time. But let me ask you, when you were in sin, did you know you were sinning? Did you understand that you were sinning? Did you understand that the ways that you were following, whether you was a believer or not, you know, this, this, is, this ain't right. This is not right. You know, taking this Reese cup out the store, it, it, it ain't right. We know it. And guess what? God knows it too. We know our sin. So we don't always have to be so quick to point other sin out. And then when we do have the opportunity to do so, it should be done in relationship. In relationship. If I see somebody out there sinning and I don't know him, I ain't going to walk out. Hey, hey, Jesus, you, you, hey, you're going to hell. No, no. It's in relationship. And if you want to find a, a story about that in the Bible, all you got to do is look at Nathan and David. The prophet Nathan and David. 
when David had Bathsheba's husband, Uriah, killed, Nathan didn't come to him directly. He kind of told him a story, and David was upset, and he was hot until he realized it was him. That was done out of relationship. All right. So individually, these five fingers can't do a whole lot. But when I close them, they can come up a powerful weapon against the kingdom of darkness. What a powerful view of u- unity this is. And unity does not mean uniformity. The resurrection of the hope of the world is not predicated on every Christian looking and acting as carbon copies. That's not what God is talking about when he's talking about unity. Instead, it's like the white keys and the black keys on the piano. They're tuned. They're tuned to the tuning fork. And as Christians, the ultimate tuning fork is God and his word and his Holy Spirit. What Jesus is praying for is that every Christian worldwide and throughout history would allow their hearts to be tuned to God. Guess what? That don't happen so easy. I, I, think, I think Jesus did say, <laughs> take up your cross daily. Why do you say that? Because today I don't feel like it. I don't feel like being in unity. I don't feel like being nice. I, it, it's a daily process. What reason, <coughs> excuse me, for God's love of the world? When the body of Christ is unified in purpose, we form something that can shake the gates of hell. What's a great example of the body of Christ being united? A great example was 9-11. 9-11. I don't know if there's a time in history when after 9-11 where the churches were more filled, where people were doing more things, that people were loving their brothers and sisters with the love of Christ. Or when some type of uh, calamity happens, hurricanes and those things, when we come together to serve those who are in need. See, the defeat and weakness of the church can be traced to the failure in unity. For the body of Christ, for the church to be effective, we must be unified. Unity is not sameness. Unity has to do with same purpose. And so in in order for us to be united, there are three requirements for unity. Three requirements for unity. Number one is unity requires connection. Verses 20 and 21. Verse 20 says, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who believe in me through their word. Praying not only for the disciples, but all who would ever believe in them. 21 says, and that they may be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I am in you. Here, Jesus' prayer is significant. Jesus prays for us to be one as he and the Father, and this is a very high view of unity. Does anyone feel as believers, that we've achieved this level of unity. No, me neither. But guess what? We do not need to despair because in verse 21, Jesus tells us to have unity and why it's important. Let's talk about how do we gain that unity. The example is the Trinity. The Trinity is the example, y'all. And the Trinity for a lot, you know, my brother is Muslim and, and you know, he's like, I can kind of understand what you're talking about, but this, this Trinity thing, it kind of messes me up. They're three in one, they're both God, they're all God, but they're different people. That's the example. They were united, but they each had different assignments. They had different modus of oper- operation. The Trinity. The Trinity. Unity is a product of our union with Christ. Or, as another way put, unity is the product of our connection with Christ. Connecting in community 
through Christ. It's not important just to connect and to be unified. Guess what, y'all? Guess what? There are a lot of examples <coughs> of unity that aren't good. Biblically, the Tower of Babel. Man, they were unified. They was doing something. They was getting it done. But what was the purpose? What was the purpose? The, uh, the siege on the Capitol, that was unity, y'all. And res- regardless of what your political side and understanding of, <coughs> people were injured, people were hurt, property was damaged. That was unity for the wrong purpose. Whatever you're trying to accomplish, it didn't get accomplished in that purpose. So being unified I- is one thing, but being unified in Christ is another thing. We must fight for unity, y'all. We must fight for unity. And guess what? We got to fight for it in all of our relationships. In all of our relationships. Those of us who are married, we got to fight for unity. We have to fight for unity. Sometimes I know, and I'm going to say it the other way. I ain't going to say it this way. Sometimes I know I get on Pastor Pearl's nerves. Every last one of them but I'm thankful that she fights for unity. Even when I'm in there and she's loaded the dishwasher and I move everything around the dishwasher because she didn't put it in the right place. OCD at its best. It's a bit heartbreaking, y'all, to read Jesus' final prayer about what he cared about the most and then to think about the current state of the church. I'm afraid that we've decided to focus on all the ways that we are different or at odds with one another rather than focusing on what we have in common. The truth is living your life with love for God and the love of people is no easy task. People will make you angry. People will hurt you. People will disappoint you. They'll offend you. But as Christians, we must strive to live with one another in unity. David, come here. Now, this is my, my good friend, come on, stand up for me, good friend David here. And I've known David almost six years. <coughs> and we met at, th- at the gym, the Lifetime Fitness. They were just opening a new gym. I signed up for, you know, when you join a new gym, you got to sign up for the, the personal training. And I signed up for the personal training. And the guy who signed me up was a big muscular guy. Kinda we, we were kind of in the same vein. I said, okay, I'm, I'm going to get him. And then David's muscular. He's just not quite as big, but he's muscular. They assigned David to me. And I looked, I saw him, and I, I, I'm, pro- I'm 25 years David Sr. And I wa- one, I wasn't sure, like, you know, what, what this young whippersnapper going to teach? What are you going to teach me? Man, I played college ball. I played semi-professional ball. I've been around the gym a time or two, but I got some food around me a time or two. And I was like, I knew, I knew something about it. And David, um, he, you know, he gave me an assessment. And he realized right off the bat that I was strong. There's no question about that. But he also noticed that I had some issues and challenges with mobility. And, and man, we had these 30-minute sessions, and I would get done with these 30-minute sessions, and I'd be sweating. I'm like, man, this, this is rough. The point I want to make, though, is in our conversation and talking, and I can't remember to this day how, but somehow our faith came up. Our faith came up. And I'm telling you this because in your comings and goings, don't be afraid to share your faith. Don't be afraid to talk about Jesus. Now I have a lifelong friend because we shared our faith. We shared our faith. So I'm thankful for him. Come here. This is what we're called to do. We're called to, to link up. We're called to link up. Now, if we link like this, it would be easy if Mark came here and ran through this right here. He would knock both of us over. Our hands would go flying, probably break our wrists. But when we're locked up like this, nothing can come against. But, 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 pastor, pastor, did, did you realize that David is white? But, 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 pastor, did you realize that David pours his milk in his cereal bowl before he puts his cereal in? (laughs) (laughs) 
but, 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 but pastor, <laughs> did you realize that David, when he goes to the beach, he wears tennis shoes and he doesn't wear flip-flops on the beach? But you know what? David is my brother. We're connected in community through Christ. And because we're connected in community through life, our lives can be transformed. I'm living the abundant life. So back off. And not only is David my friend, he's my brother. He's a believer. He's the one that God sent his son to die for. You better back up off of us. We believe and we will shake the gates of hell together. That's what unity looks like. I use those examples because, you know, we, we hear enough about the race. We hear enough about the politics. We hear enough about that. There are some things that David and I probably think differently on. But guess what? It doesn't change our relationship. We are bonded by Christ, and we won't let anyone or anything break that bond. Amen? Amen. Thank you. Amen. How do we fight? How do we fight? Let's go to Ephesians chapter 4. And I'm going to read verses 1 through 6. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. Therefore, I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling, for you have been called by God. Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowances for each other's faults because of love. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the spirit, binding yourself together in peace. For there is one body and one spirit, just as you and I have been called to one glorious hope for the future. For there is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all, in all, and living through all. How do we fight for our unity? In verse 1, he tells us to walk worthy of our calling. And oftentimes in, 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 in the body of Christ, we're like, what is my calling? What am I called to do? What am I called to do? Am I a pastor? Am I an evangelist? What, what am I called to do? What we are called to do is live a life that exhibits godly character, moral courage, personal integrity, and mature behavior. A life that expresses gratitude for your salvation. That is the call of every believer. Now, we all have other calls and other gifts and talents, but that's what we do. Godly, godly character, moral behavior, personal integrity, and mature behavior. That is what we are called to do. Verse number two. <coughs> Verse number two. Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other. Husbands, wives, be patient with each other. Making allowances for each other's fault because of your love. Man, it took me, me and Pearl and I have been, uh, September will be 19 years. Man, it took me like seven years, man. I used to always, when I take off my pants, I would hang my pants over the top of the door. And then I would throw my socks wherever I took them off. And, and, and she told me many, many times, hey, stop doing this, stop doing this. And then it was all, one day it was almost like revelation. Boom, hey, man, stop hanging your pants on the door. I didn't see no big deal, but it was something that was annoying to her. But guess what? She made allowances for my faults. Just like I make allowances for the way she loads the dishwasher. <laughs> I just change it. <laughs> Verse number three. Paul says, Listen to this, y'all. Paul says that we are to make every effort to keep the unity of peace that has been given to us in the purpose of Christ. What? What? K keep, keep unity. We already have unity. When we come into the body, he's given us the unity already. Now we have to fight to keep it, to keep the peace. We got to follow the example Jesus demonstrated Throughout his life, we must carry ourselves in humility. Not false humility, humility. We must remain kind hearted. We must be patient with one another. And Paul gives the biggest reason for this it's because we've been given one spirit, 
one body, and one hope. When we fail to fight for unity in the church, it becomes very easy to allow everything to be a us versus them. Man, us, it, us versus them. Yeah, yes, it should be us versus them. Us, the kingdom of believers, versus the kingdom of darkness. Man, God, if we could really put aside our differences, think of others more highly than we, not, not thinking of ourselves more highly than we ought to, and thinking about others, man, we could, we could do some damage to the kingdom of God. We could do some damage. And it's, and it's not going to start from up here, y'all. It's not going to start from up here. It's going to start with you, Tracy. It's going to start with you, Mandy. It's going to start with you, Tiana. It's going to start with you, Elizabeth. When I have the opportunity, when there's something that's divisive and something that I wholeheartedly don't agree with, how am I going to respond how, how am I going to respond? Guess what? Jesus, I mean, God knows what's in here. He knows his word. The last I checked, Ed Canty don't have a gavel. I don't have a gavel. I am not judge and jury. God tells us that we have to walk out our own salvation with fear and trembling. Love folks. Love folks. Our desire here at the place is a place that people of all backgrounds will come. I ex fully expect, probably won't be in this building, but when we're in our, in, our, in our space, I fully expect Muslims to come in. I fully expect Buddhists to come in. I fully expect people of the LGBTQ, all the letters, to come in. And you know what we're going to do? We're going to love them. We are going to love them. We're going to love them with the love of Christ. As I asked earlier, do, do we know our sins? We do know our sins. Folks know what they're doing, but they want to see what's different about them people over at the plate. What's different? You know, I, I, I went in there and I was acting kind of crazy. But they didn't even judge me. Didn't nobody even say anything to me about it. They just loved me. They hugged on me. They shared the word with me. They gave opportunity for me to receive prayer. What are we doing to show the world that we're different? That's the thing. Our, our unity affects people's perception of Christ. Our unity affects people's perception of Christ. We know that. We've seen it. So many of so many don't want to believe because of the hypocrisy of Christians. Man, what should y'all do the same thing as the world does? Y'all are more judgmental than the world is. You know, we have all these rules and regulations and, you know, all of these things that we do in church that people who might not be ch church don't really understand what they are. And here's the thing, guys. Are they important? I grew up uh, in, in, in the black community. I grew up where not only church, and, and, and it might not just be black community, but you don't wear a hat inside. You don't wear, you don't wear a hat inside. If you wear a hat inside a church, oh, mm -mm, that's, that's a challenge. And, and, and man, at my, my previous church, uh, the worship leader, he wore a fedora on his head. And I was like, man, that, that, that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. You get, it's not even an issue of salvation. Why are we making so much out of little? Not even an issue of salvation. So, you know, and we could argue with them about it, or we can do something to change it. I, 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 will, I, will, I will share this. I will share this. Uh, I, at my previous church in, back in Virginia, I was um, over the men's ministry. And I did that for about 10 years. And we had we had a, a couple gentlemen that were in a, in the church, and they were in men's men. They were in the church, and they uh, they dealt with uh, same sex attraction. And I'm over all the men, biologically. They're men, and people were like, 
I'm a I'm a hugger. I believe I believe that men um, need physical connection to other men. And you know, it's the kids that say no homo. <laughs> I know that's not that's not PC, but men need other connection from other men. And I would hug these young men like I would hug any other men. And I wasn't shy. I wasn't afraid that they were gonna you know be attracted to me. I just love them. I just loved them. And then as time went on and God was making a shift and change in their life because because they received love, they decided not to step outside of the church. They decided not to leave. They decided to stay under the covering. And then when the teaching went forward from the pulpit, now I've made relationship with them. Now they say, hey, you know, at the time they called me Big Ed. I wasn't a minister yet. Hey, Big Ed, hey, can I talk to you about this? I know pastor said such and such and such and such, but I don't really, um, I don't really quite understand that. And we went to the scripture and we talked about it. this is what God says about same sex attraction and so forth. Why you feel the way you do, why you're dealing with the things. Guess what? I don't have an answer. I understand what God's word says. We're going to love you. God loves you regardless of where you are right now. You're gonna have God's gonna have to give you clarity and revelation of the situation. Cause guess what? Me, Ed, man, don't have the answer. But out of relationship, y'all, out of relationship. Pe- the people who are dealing in sin, they are not less than, y'all. They are not less than. God loves all. Number two. Oh man, I'm I gotta speed up here. Number two, unity requires perfection. Verses 22 and 23, and the, Lord, and the glory which you gave me, I have given to them that they may be one as you and I are one. I and them and you and me, that they may be made perfect in one, that the world will know that you have sent me and love me. Yeah, the perfection. We always say there can't be perfection. You can't be perfection. Hey, the scripture says. And these things, there are things in scripture which I said are beyond the capacity for us to understand while we're still in this body. And one of those things about the gl- is about the glorification of Christ. Romans 10, 830 8 refers to glorification in the past tense. It just says, moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, he also glorified he also glorified so God has given God has given us some of the glory that he gave Jesus and this is just to understand the oneness in the Trinity we share the glory in Christ that we might be more unified he goes on in verse 23 Christ is in us God in Christ we are directly connected to the Godhead the connection is to make us perfect in one. On our own, y'all, we are incomplete, we're unfinished, and we are imperfect. But when we come to Christ, we are brought into union with him. We are brought into the body of Christ and connected to our brothers and sisters. That's what makes us complete. The body of Christ completes the believer. Our unity with Christ connects us. And where there is no perfection, there is no unity. Where there is no perfection, there is no unity. Point number three, unity requires love. Unity requires love. Verses 24 and 26, Father I desire that those whom also you gave me may be with me where I am, that they may behold the glory which you have given me, for you have loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world has not known me, but I have known you, and these have known that you sent me. And I have declared to them your name and will declare it to them, that with the love which you love me may be in them and I in them. Verse 24 is really a precious verse. Jesus Christ's desire is that we all be with him for eternity. That's why he came, that man himself would be reconciled unto God. Had Jesus not come, we 
mankind would be roaming around on this earth, and then, you know, when they, when they depart, they won't be with Jesus. They won't be with the Father. He, Jesus came that we be reconciled unto the Father. In verse 25, he's basically just saying that the world has not known the Father. We only know the Father through Christ. He has revealed the Father unto us. When we see Christ, we see the Father. John 1.18 says, No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. The end of verse 25 says that we have known that Jesus, the Father, sent Jesus to us. Why does this matter, y'all? Why did the Father send Jesus? What did he send them to do? He sent him to be the Lamb of God whose sacrifice would take away the sins of the world. Why did the Father do this? Say it with me, y'all. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but shall have everlasting life. That's why, y'all, that is the why he sent Jesus and why he wants us to be in unity. The Father sent the Son to pay the penalty for sin for one reason, because he loved us. Because he loved us. When you do for your children, when they ain't acted a fool, you do it because you love them. When you do for your siblings, when last night, you, you know, he, he, he took your clothes or he didn't, you, know, you do it because you, lo- you love them. Unity requires love. If there's no love, there's no unity. If there's no unity, there's no true church. Church of the people, not the building. If there's no true church, the gospel does not go out. The gospel doesn't go out from the building. It goes out from the people. If the gospel does not go out, people die in unbelief. Unity is serious, y'all. God's love is serious. The mission of God, guess what? It could have been accomplished by Jesus all on his own. He could have came down. He could have wiped out this whole sin issue with birth. He could have, he could, God can do anything. He could have fixed it. But one of the most astonishing things about our faith is that we believe Jesus invited sinful human beings just like you and me to join him in his plan to rescue the world. Jesus had 12 ordinary men who bought into the idea that heaven could be brought to earth. Though they didn't ha- he did, though he did not have to, Jesus chose them to be the ones who would carry on the plan of God. It's because Jesus knew that they would accomplish more together than they could ever do on their own. When God's people work together in love, it brings hope to the world. In it of ourselves, we don't have much to offer. We're fragile and broken people. But sometimes something special happens when we unite over the love of God. And we allow God's love to motivate us to change the world. So in conclusion, y'all, I'm wrapping it up, bringing it in for a landing here. A common image used in scripture, uh, and I actually already talked about this, is to talk about the body. And Paul elaborates this in a few verses later in Ephesians. In Ephesians 4 and 16, and I'll get it here in the word. It says, he makes the whole body fit together perfectly. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. I'm 25 years David Sr., but because of our relationship, because we don't just only talk about workouts and nutrition and those things, but we talk about the love of Christ, I've grown from him. 
and he's grown from me. Mama Mary, I, I've just only known you from a short time. Just the little words that you say to me in God's love have allowed me to grow, not only as a man, but to grow as a pastor. When we work together in love, it allows us to grow, y'all. It, it allows us to grow. And if we're open and we're willing and we remain teachable, anything is possible, y'all. All of the individual pieces are built up with love. So in doing so, we can accomplish a great work, y'all. Unity is necessary if we're going to reach a lost world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Unity brings the strength and support we need as we live for Christ. But the problem is unity doesn't just happen. We have unity in Christ, but we are responsible to maintain that unity. We are responsible to maintain that unity. Unity requires connection, it requires perfection, and it requires love. If we're not connected to Christ and one another, we cannot have unity. If we're not finding completion in Christ and his body, we cannot have unity. Unity impacts every relationship that we have. And it is to be sought after, it is to be guarded, and it is to be protected. Would you stand, please? Father, we just thank you, God, for allowing your word to go forward today, God. We pray that it has reached its intended target, Lord God. God, as we leave this place, God, as we go on our way as kingdom ambassadors, God, may we fight for the unity, God. Will we always be humble and patient and kind-hearted, God, and allow others their faults, God, as we, we seek you, Lord God, for anything that is needed. We just want to pray now, if anyone is feeling out there, feeling lost or alienated from you, Jesus, we ask, God, that you heal us, God, that you allow us to be drawn near to you. Help us to be ambassadors and reconcilers of the world. Today is a great opportunity if you don't know Christ or if you've known him at one time and that you've stepped away, today would be a great day to rededicate your life to me, to, to, to Jesus. And I'm just going to ask, we're going to say a simple prayer, and I ask everyone to repeat it with me. For those of you watching via live streaming, you know, you can just repeat it quietly where you are. Heavenly Father, I thank you for sending your son, for taking the penalty of sin that we deserve. Today, I believe that you sent your son to live, to die, to be buried, and to be resurrected that I may have eternal life. I confess with my mouth and I believe in my heart and I ask you to come in today First, to be my Savior, then to teach me how to allow you to be my Lord. And I will serve you for the rest of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer either here in, in, in locally where you don't, were not saved or needed to rededicate or online, you are now in the body of Christ. You have that unity of being in the Father and Him and you. And I just uh, encourage you to find, it doesn't have to be the place, I encourage you to find a local church where you can go in, you can be fed, you can learn the Word, and you can continue to grow. Amen, 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 amen.